and welcome. This is Inside Sources, and my name is Laulu Akonde. My take for this week is on why leaders must be the strongest advocate of public interest and its fiercest defenders, especially when it comes to critical institutions such as the Central Bank of Nigeria. Our leaders, especially those in the executive arm of government, and I'm talking especially about the president, must be quick to punish and terminate infractions against public interest or any violation of it. I remember in 2015, when the APC was campaigning for change, there were several references to allegations of corruption that were carried through the CBN. For instance, there was the position that it got to a point during a week that CBN had no foreign currency because of what had happened with corruption. Guess what? APC won the election, but kept that same CBN leadership in position. I guess the leadership got a second chance. But eight years after, listening to some of the damaging revelations that we have had about what happened in the CBN, you wonder what would have happened or what would have saved ourselves, saved our economy, if that leadership had been brought under control or punished or terminated. The point today is that presidents especially must be the strongest defender of public interest, especially when we talk about critical institutions like the CBA. And we hope that what is going on now, the revelation that we are hearing, will not just be swept under the carpet. Too much damage has been done to the Nigerian economy. Too much suffering has been taken by the Nigerians, and this has to stop. Thank you, and I'll be right back with Inside Sources with our guest for the day. Welcome back to Inside Sources. Today we continue the conversation on the future of Nigeria, and I have uh, quite an exciting uh, individual, a man of courage, uh, and somebody who has served Nigeria, uh, both in government and outside government. I'm talking of no less a person than Pa Edward Clark, for a former federal uh, commissioner and a leader in this country by any uh, uh, imagination. Uh, uh, pa, Edward Clark, you are welcome to the program. Thank you very much. And thank you for, for being uh, our guest. Thank you. Excellent. Our time. Thank you, sir. So I, I want to start with uh, this question that I ask, you know, uh, quite often. What do you think about the trajectory of our country? Do you think, as things stand today, in terms of how the country is set up, in terms of how government functions and how people operate, are we heading in the right direction? We are not going the right direction. Okay. Nigeria can only go the right direction. If you set up, if you restructure this country down, from the top to down. So what do you mean by this? Because restructuring is this. The military came in 1986. No, before yes, city six years. He runs me by decree number thirty-four. He united the whole country, turned the country into a unity form of government. Instead of a federation where you have southern Nigeria and where you have western Nigeria, northern Nigeria and eastern Nigeria. You get in this point mm. and midwest region. Yes, yes. These these can these regions from the federal system from the Federation of Nigeria. And they were asked, they managed the resources at their level, at the, in their region, and federal government received a part of it. For instance, the 1963 Constitution, 63, in fact, in section 401, 402, says that the region where the resources are produced shall receive 50% of the of such resources to develop themselves at their own level. Twenty percent 
will be given to the federal government to manage the federal services like custom, mm. police, and so on. The remaining 30% will go to the Zimbabwe pool, which will be shared again among the four uh, the, the regions and the federal government. That was the situation that existed in 1966. And that the whole federal service, and that was the, before the, before 66. Yeah. And, it, and it was part of the constitution of 1960, independent constitution, and Republic, Republican constitution, constitution the made by all Nigerians. So do you think we should go back there? We should go back to the 1963 constitution with some little addition, amendment, and so on. Okay, all right. And unless you go back there, there will be no Nigeria. Because Nigerians have, have the British haven't gone. They are now replacing their fellow Nigerians as their bosses. Mm. Where some people are now claiming first class citizenship due to population or otherwise. The very people who said that they don't want independence for Nigeria because they have not reached that st standard. Now, some of them now claiming that we are anti federal uh, and, and uh, we are anti uh, reconstruction. Reconstruction means this. We, 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 we restructuring, you mean? Restructuring, I'm sorry. Restructuring means this that the federal, which returned the federal system of government as it was in 1963, where you have four regions. Those four regions had their own constitu constitution. Those four regions had their own flag. Those four regions. Nigeria had a, a representative in London called Nigerian High Commissioner. Mm. That's the embassy. Yes. Each of these four uh, three states, uh, regions, each of these states, regions, had agent general representing them in London. Chief, let me ask you. I wasn't, but I used to attend Western Nigeria agent general under Kurogunu. But when Midwest region was created in 1963, yes, they have their agent general in the name of Barisai Boki. Okay, very, very, very interesting point. Point. very interesting point. I, 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 so I moved from I, I moved from oh, Western yeah. Nigeria, where oh, I never oh, understood oh. Yoruba language, to my own region. Okay, let's let's take it forward because I wanted to raise a, a yeah, go on, point go on. about the structure. Yeah. So, so we should go back to four regions or maybe more. You know, but my question. No, is, no let me say this. I will answer that question now. The present, our present president. Yes. President Tinubu to yeah. was one of the, those of, of them at that time who championed the cause of a sovereign national conference that is to restructure Nigeria. That was a very, very great, serious one. That if the report of the sovereign national conference succeeds and submitted to a referendum, if they say present government should go, a new government recommended by the Sovereign Conference would say, that's it. That was why uh, this Kereku also of the no, Republic of Benin left office. Yeah, that's right. This was what Nigerian leaders were afraid of. That's why they continue to oppose restructuring. You know the meaning now? Yes, yes, I get it. So I now believe that a restructuring in Nigeria should come first. Because we, 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 we advised President Jonathan to restructure this country, to set up a party, to discuss. That was why he decided in 2014 to set up the National Conference. Conference yes. First of all, he set up a subcommittee under Senator Femi Okurumu. Yes. Mm. And I know some do do work on that. It was that report that gave birth to the national the conference. 90, uh, the 2014 14. national conference. The consular conference was not done on party basis. It contained 492 
members. Members, delegates. And these delegates were not only from the whole of the country, but they represented each. All ethnic groups were represented. All religious bodies were represented. All professional bodies were represented. Chief, do you think or are you saying that the current uh, presidential uh, administration should go back to the report of the Constitutional Conference of 2014? God bless you. If we don't go there, let me add this to you. My friend, uh, B.C. Akondese, uh, respected friend, B.C. Akondese, is true. Being an APC leader, he only dwelt on the Air Rufai's report. Okay, so that was at the last... Air Rufai's report. Uh, the party said in 2015, 2015, when he was campaigning, that he would restructure this country. It was one of their front burner. And he would corrupt, he will uh, eradicate corruption and, and they bring about security in the country and the economy of the country. Let's not go into those politics. Now, Jonathan could have operated part of that recommendation, particularly the administrative aspect of it, was carried away by, by election. He said time was very short for him. But in fairness to him, he handed over that report to his successor, Muhammad Buhari, that this is the report, unless you do this, this country will stand on a shaky ground. What did he do? He threw it into the dustbin that you go into the archives. Unless you bring this government of President Tinubu, bring that report back, because Aerovice report was not different from the 2014 report. Bring it together, but now they do. I've spoken on them. I've written about them. They are identical. They merely want, even in certain places, they were even more uh, straightforward than um, 2014 in certain aspects. I will say that. How will you assess the problem of corruption in Nigeria? On its whole, it's on increase. There's corruption. Well, perhaps you must have read my letter, open letter last week to the Chief Justice, yes. to the most referred Chief Justice of Nigeria. Yes. Where I said, please investigate. Set up a committee to, uh, to look into immediate re re reorganization of the, uh, of the judiciary because of so many things. Supreme Court judges going against Supreme Judges in the administration of justice in Nigeria. That's a shame. The highest court we have, the court next to God, the members of, of themselves are criticizing one another. The President Chief Justice of Nigeria hated the team, the rest of his members, 14 of them. They criticized the Tanko, Justice Tanko, that he that took power into his own hand, traveled with his children and his family. He would not allow the rest of the judges of the Supreme Court to travel. No right. Generator broke down. Vehicles were not working. Judges could not write their report. So many things. To imagine that justices of the Supreme Court will come to a stage where they, are, they criticize their, their boss, their, 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 their fellow just chief, chief justice. Yeah. Chief just, uh, justice. Not only that, the man who was second to the president chief justice of Nigeria now, retired. I cannot remember the name now. That's it, Joe. That he was in Tatijo. And poke his mind that today the judiciary filled up with children of justices, children of, un and, uh, of uncles, stepdaughters, stepchildren, whereas the most important qualified Nigerians who should be in the judiciary who were left out, are left out. Now, look at it, man, like. The liars. Just the liars. Just the liars. The, the liars. 
was a scholar. But he later became the Chief Justice of Nigeria. Mm. Look at Akuda. Akiolaguda. Akiolaguda. Most, much too many scholars today. There are many Nigerian lawyers who are capable of being members of the Supreme Court. And, and legal scholars. The legal scholars who have been, um, whatever name they call them, of the advanced legal um, institution. So, so, so he believes that, that the people that should go to the Supreme Court as justices they should not only be practicing judges. Not, no. How can you, in a big country like us, where we have one of the, the largest bar associations in Africa? True. To say that uh, only um, practicing judges, practicing judges from, selected from the Court of Appeal, you are not improving the. The, the, the situation, I'm sorry to say. Just, just move along to ask you a uh, few other uh, current issues. What yes. is happening in, in River State uh, today? What do you think has to happen to solve the problem in River State? Where, uh, of course, the godfather and the godson uh, don't seem to agree. Number one, what's happening in River State today? And by the intervention of Mr. President, it's, a, it's something that should not happen in a modern democratic society. We are not in a dictatorial government. We are not in a military regime. The, the, the constitution of this country, we have not abrogated it. We are still using the parts that are usable. Section 109 2G also says that any member of gov of the legislature, whether Senate, House of Representatives, or the House of Assembly, who moves cross carpet from the party that sponsored him into that legislature, yes, automatically loses his seat. That's what he said. And number two, the House, the INEC would then declared uh, will then organize the election within 90 days to fill those positions. And nobody, including Mr. President, has the authority or power to order the Constitution. These members retired, no, cross carpet from PDP, the, power, the, power, uh, the party that nominated, that sponsored uh, them, to ABC. The, the party which their matter is one leg in and one leg out. That, that means in weekly. And thereby forfeiting their, automatically they have lost their seats. There can never be a vacuum in the house. And I support what legal uh, experts have said, including Falana, that the members out of 32, 27 of them said they have, they have left. They become um, APC, waving the flags of APC and singing the, the, the campaign song of uh, Mr. President in the house. And uh, at an ungodly hour of 7 a.m. Now, once they have left, whether five or four, remain the members. They would not cross remain members of the House of Assembly. Therefore, the issue of quorum, as they have always talked, is not applicable in this case. The number that remain in Parliament, in the, in the House of Assembly, yeah. from there they constitute uh, the, the, assembly. The, the Assembly, and the quorum is drawn from there. This happened in Benin, a do state, during the time of Ochomole, during the time of uh, Godwin Obaseki, we had 14 members who were not sworn in, who did not take their oath about it, were kept out for almost four years. They couldn't. And the man ruled with about 10 or 11 or sometimes 9, 10, and so on. That one did not fall. There was a president in this country. 
if Mr. President want to plead his friend Wiki, this is not how to do. He cannot uh, sacrifice the, the interest of the people of River State. So I we threaten the elders of River State, including past governors, threatening that this was unacceptable to them, and Nigeria and they should return. So how can you say that 27 members who have lost their seats should go back to the house and meet anywhere they like? The question is, are they going back to their party if you are talking of certain school? Are they going back to PDP? Or are they members of, uh, uh, they will go back as members of APC? The speaker has answered that they have gone back as members of APC because they like President Tinubu's government. So you are now saying that the governor should now represent a budget he signed into law. Where has it happened before? It's only the court can declare that budget, uh, whether legal or not illegal. Whether legal or illegal. I think you follow what I mean. I follow you. And not Mr. President. But, 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 but sir, if you follow, and I want to put this as a question. That uh, outcome of the meeting was not a presidential statement. So, so the presidency did not come out and say this was what happened. Do you, so, so do you believe that the outcome of that meeting was something that the president personally endorsed? Listen, I have heard from those who attended, okay. both in the House of Representatives, members, I don't want to mention their names here. One of them even spoke there. I've listened to others who attended. President came into the hall where everybody was seated. He had this paper, the so-called agreement. And the first thing he did was to attack the, the governor, Pubra, that he was undemocratic. Why did he say so? Because five members, he used five members to pass his budget into, into law. That with that, Mr. President is a man who ruled the whole country. This boy, this young man has never been a politician. So once you threatened him like that, then he handed over the same piece of paper to old Governor uh, Peter Odili, the former governor of uh, River State, to read. While he was reading it, they, according to them, he was in the, uh, Mr. President was interjecting. So at the end of it all, the people were asked to sign the agreement. We can sign, sign in red ink. And uh, the NSC, the Badu signed in red ink. Alleged that Odili and uh, the governor, which you have signed also in red ink, signed in black ink. If you are not signing the, your signature in the usual manner, all the document for the past six or seven months, signed by Fubra in River State, was signed with red ink, even in Abuja. Why has he now decided to sign this particular agreement with, uh, with the blue, blue viral? Being be, be, be a lawyer, sir, do you think that matters? It matters a lot. When questioning the validity, the veracity of a signature, what had been happening before would be taken into consideration. Mm. What made this man to sign in black such an important document he thought it was? Why? So it's questionable. However, the elders of River State have gone to court to challenge that document, that that document is worthless, is it legal? I should be the best Yes, yeah, sir. So since 1999, um, the Nigerian Constitution has amended, has actually given such uh, uh, states, you know, a point producer state, actually 30% derivation. Mm. Now, two questions. Mom, do you think that the, the governments, you know, that we have had in the South, uh, South state and the point producer states have managed the additional, the significant? Additional. That is not the question, man. No, 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 just two question. I have come to that. I've written. That was why I I reported 
the governor of uh, of Delta State for misusing our uh, resources, derivation money. What is open today? Ninety percent of the oil that generates revenue for Nigeria yes. is found in the Niger Delta, or what you call South South today. Delta, Rivers, Aquaibon, and Bayasa produce 90% in August this year of the oil. Whereas Abia produce 0.7 or 8. Imo produce 1.02. Uh, Ondo produce less than 4. four. Percent. It does produce less than five percent. But the people who produce this oil are excluded from everything, from the operation of the oil. The children are not employed, not only that. NNPC, which was set up in the 70s to look after the oil industry, has uh, Mr. President has just said that now the membership of that the board. The board. 11 members of that board. So, uh, the, uh, the, the chairman come from the southwest. Uh, Coco in the uh, non-oil producing area of Ondo State. Not from the southern uh, south where the oil is produced. That's the chairman. We don't worry about that. But the 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 GMD come from the north. Uh, Kiari, fine man. Intelligent fellow, let him remain in the job. But to see that the only executive of NNPC come from the not not oil producing communities. The two of them are from the north. The finance man. So the two, the only two executives are from the north. In addition to that, they have another three members. That five. Well, the chairman six. The, uh, the Southeast had one, the oil producing, as I mentioned just now. Mm -hmm. Anambra is now producing 0.9%. They have one director. The South, the South, South where the oil comes from, because of the influence of the President of the Senate, Senator Pabio, mm -hmm. they were able to have one Eunice Thomas, who used to be uh, commissioner for Women Affairs in Aquaibom State during the uh, Papua's government. Mm. The next one went to the Dormiti of Goni. I produce in the community. I have not won it, but the Delta State, which today is the leading oil producing state. Bayasa State, another major oil producing state, they have no member. What type of country do we belong to? And when you talk, they say you are anti-government. I'm not anti-government. At 96 and over, you'll be supporting government, government that is elected in Nigeria. So what am I saying? Mm. The issue is not what our people do. Our go most of our governors are corrupt. Mm. They utilize this money for themselves. Well, so imagine that my governor, my former governor, to build the university with our, uh, our uh, derivation money. It's so hard of. Hard of. It's own village which had no institution before. So they are wasting our money. He turned all the roads in his own area. Over 50 million, billion naira. Whose money? Worry, which is the headquarters of oil producing community in the South. He never touched worry. Worry was taken away until the new governor came in to say, no, worry must be developed. So what am I saying? Our governor, most of them, derailed due to corruption. That's what the question has. Corruption is the canker which is eating the fabric, everything in our country. As we have been friendly to um, uh, Mohammed Buhari, he said, we must kill corruption. If we cannot, if we don't kill corruption, corruption will kill Nigeria. 
how do you assess the the HR uh, uh, two terms of uh, president? Disaster. Well, uh, the government was the is the worst government Nigeria ever produced. It never functioned. A man who does not even know his own ministers before he left. The trouble the Mefila is facing today. Well, you just saying now that Bari made a point about fighting corruption. Yeah. He did not fight corruption. Rather, corruption grew higher, more than anybody around him in his uh, as a rock. He encouraged corruption. He is not corrupt. He's a straightforward man. But he hadn't got the ability. Yeah, he hadn't got the foresight. I don't think he was enjoying good health enough to know what was going on in this country. If anybody says, oh, guy, Buhari ruled very well, that man is an anti-Nigeria, the greatest enemy of Nigeria. What about all the things that he did in infrastructure? What infrastructure? The roads, Niger Which road? Go to the, go, to, oh, well, don't, don't, the uh, look, don't provoke me. Do you know of the East-West route? Yes. But the eight years ago, uh, he was there. What did he do? Today, you cannot pass the East-West road which is the most important economic road in Nigeria. Well, what about the second Nigeria bridge, sir? Eh? What about the second Nigeria bridge that, that they finished? It that is not South-South. Okay, if you are talking about Nigeria, I give him that credit. He was not the, be the beginner. The, the uh, bo um, Jonathan's government started the Niger, second Nigeria bridge, but he didn't do anything so far. Buhari in his uh, campaign time said within three weeks or three months Boko Haram would be a thing of the past. He has been lying to the Nigerian public that he drove away Boko Haram from 14 local governments in the north. But that's not true. If you read Jonathan's book have you read it? Yes, yes, yes. Did he not say that during the suspension of the election for five or six weeks. It was during that time. The postponement. Uh, the postponement of the election. It was during that time they used mercenaries to help them to drive uh, Boko Haram out of uh, Bonu State. It's not Buhari who did it. Rather, the whole thing increased during Buhari's time. You don't give any credit in the area of security? I cannot. I didn't. I won't give him. He kept the seven ships more than what they should say because he liked them. When the whole of Nigeria said, remove them. National Assembly said, remove them. Everybody passed the vote no confidence on them. But Buhari did not listen. A good leader should listen to the, his people. Oh, okay, just one last thing. I have yeah. mentioned and definitely wanted to make a point about that. Yes. Was no, I said, a Mephile. Whatever he's facing today, no, no Nigeria because of the situation that happened before the election, scarcity of money and all sorts of new something. Nobody, but Nigerians are very short. Many Nigerians are very short-sighted. Did the Mayfield perform these duties on his own or under the directing of Mr. President Buhari? Under his directive. The, the, the investigator today uh, put, uh, where there's an information that was put out today, that the investigator of CBN actually said that he didn't get the approval of President Buhari for the narrow design. That is not true. I had the statement. Listen, those investigators should examine themselves. I had Buhari. You just told me that I have a detentive memory. I had Buhari. When uh, the commission, the Minister of Finance, the lady, yes, Zenab Ahmed. Ahmed, was questioned. She said she knew nothing about the changes, even though the financial control of Central Bank is, in her, is, is within her, while the, the Central Bank ban monetary aspect. It was at that stage. Jordan is criticizing, and Mefile went back to, to Mr. President. And President did not listen to his Minister of Finance. 
So if anybody says that uh, Buhari was not consulted, let me go further to tell you. Um, I mean, I mean, pre-citizen of this country. Absolutely. You, but have, nobody knows about it. A Mayfile was to print this new currency abroad. So when he took it to Mr. President, as we used to do, yes. when he took it to Mr. President, let them prove me wrong. It was the president who noted in it that use local printer because his brother-in-law, his wife's brother, was the managing director of those who printed this money. So it was Buhari who did it. If he had taken it abroad, he could have printed enough money. Thank you so much, uh, Chief, for uh, for your time and for being part of Thank you very much. And uh, we continue the conversation. Welcome back to Inside Sources. I have a second guest today, and we'll be talking about what has been happening for a long time, which occurred again, sadly, on Christmas Eve, where so far we have more than 100 people killed just before Christmas. I'm talking about the situation, the very disturbing situation in Plato, three local governments in Plato. To discuss this issue with, with us today, I have a veteran of the uh, Nigerian military who was actually uh, a commander in the Operation Save Heaven that was based in Plato and who has experience in the work uh, he was also a former sector commander of the United Nations uh, Force in Sudan. Uh, let me welcome Major General Antony, retired Major General Antony Atolagbe. You are welcome to Inside Sources, General. Yeah, good morning, good afternoon, uh, Laulu, and uh, good afternoon to the audience. Uh, so, General, I, I want us to take it from the point of view of what has uh, been a critical review of the response of the security agencies uh, to what happened on Christmas Eve in, in the three local governments of Bakos, uh, uh, Bak, uh, Bakinladi, and Mangu, you know, where uh, over 100 uh, people were killed. Now, some of the narrative that has come out is that uh, some of the security agencies uh, did say that they couldn't assess the location. Uh, that it was difficult to assess the location. And, you know, there's been quite a lot of critical pushback that how did those people, the, 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 the terrorists, how did they get there if the military couldn't get there? So based on your own experience, uh, you were a center commander in that particular theater. How do you respond to that, uh, General? Um, two issues uh, you mentioned, uh, the logistics and the routes to the uh, action spots. Um, the logistic aspect, I am very uh, well aware that uh, is taken care of uh, by the federal government through the defense headquarters. If anything has changed, I might not be able to tell, but uh, the logistics, I think, is uh, manageable and is uh, deployable for uh, any kind of uh, threat around the area. Um, the, the issue of uh, the routes to the locations, I, I, I will say that uh, there are some approaches to some of the locations that are very bad. Uh, if you go through Bokos, uh, towards the dam, towards the where, the, where there's a dam, somewhere where you go through, uh, the, pass through Bakinadi, go through Bokos, you enter in, then you get to another place where there is a dam. That, the area, another place, was where the other incident took place when I was there, where the uh, imam had to house some people in the mosque. There was no way the people were even going to escape. So the only escape route was for them to move to the mosque. If they had options, they would have. But the place is 
is deep, deep, deep into the uh, some gully areas like that where the people actually are living. Now, do you think that it is acceptable an excuse uh, that the the security agencies couldn't assess the place? Should we, as a people, accept that kind, you know, of of excuse? That, that, that that's actually what I'm trying to get at, uh, General. If you don't mind. Okay, let me give you an example of uh, what I think could avert such things. Because I, I could recall that when I was there, I did an estimate and I discovered that most of the uh, action spots don't have roads. They are track roads. So how do you... And when the... the, the High authorities want to give you the logistics. They give you vehicles. What are you going to do with vehicles in those areas? So I started buying motorcycles. Mm. I go to Kaduna, just road. At the junction there, I buy motorcycles. I started, and then there were some motorcycles that were seized from some people before I got there. By the time I was leaving, I had 60 of them. And I trained the troops on motorcycle operations. So it was a little um, easier for us to carry out pursuits. But if we go with vehicles, then it, it may be difficult, as they are saying. Do you know whether so those, 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 uh, sorry, uh, do you know whether those motorcycles are still uh, uh, being used, you know, uh, you know, because you are saying that those motorcycles I mean, would have made it possible to access uh, these distant places? Yeah, like that place I actually described that that during that incident. So a distance of about I think less than is it five kilometers. It takes almost an hour to get there. And the, the, the funniest part, I think the network also in the area was bad. So those are some of the factors that uh, perhaps might have uh, I, I'm not there, but I know there are some bad uh, approaches to some of those locations. But with motorcycles, the, the responses could have been a lot uh, better, okay, not so, vehicles. So, so, so uh, when you were the, uh, the commander in, in that place, what was the kind of response time, you know, uh, that you had to deal with uh, if you had any, any such experience? What we did was to make sure that these motorcycle guys are deployed across the terrain especially the hot spots. Mm. But in, in, in almost all the, in the space where we were operating, mm. motorcycles were just the best that we could employ. In fact, in the night, when the Fulani cartoons are rustled, they call us, and the motorcycle will go after the rustlers and get the cartoons back from them. Unlike what used to happen before, they will only call in the morning when they have already taken their cattle away. But we were catching up with them and collecting the cattle to make sure that. And in fact, we lock all entries around Plateau States that time in the evening so that no uh, trailer can move out with cattle in them until we are able to verify the owners of those uh, cattle. Mm. Well, General, those were the measures we put in place. Yeah. So, so thank you. Uh, the, the, part of the problem, uh, in my view, uh, and, and based on my own understanding uh, of this situation, is that so this problem has been on for a long time, and it seems that the perpetrators are essentially the same, and that there's a lot of impunity. You know, uh, uh, they are either not arrested, or if they are arrested, they are later released, and they come back again. In, in your own experience, what is the role of impunity? playing in perpetuating uh, some of these crises. The role of, you know, not getting the people involved properly punished, not imposing consequences. Based on your experience, General, how much damage do you think that does to the situation, which then led to another attack uh, on Christmas Eve? Okay, like, you know, when I got there, there was a bill, I think, in the House of Assembly to review the administration of justice in Plateau State, which was not yet out. So, uh, in that, in the, in the initial uh, 
uh, administration of justice uh, document that the state has, arresting somebody with weapons, I think I learned, will cost 2,000 is it pounds or so. So it was easy to bail people. Uh, but with the review then, you know, when I made the, I, 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 I started, I, I look at the whole situation, I didn't have any equipment to carry out arrest. Like in, in Miango now, for, for example, they are saying that, the Flanese the are saying that, they bought the land for 99 years. Mm. But when the crisis took place, they drove them away. So what happens to the land? Those are some of the things that make them to want to fight their way back into the area. Then we have instances where cows, uh, you, you, they go to destroy farms. When they go to destroy farms, that's maybe they ask their children to follow their cattle to go and graze, and the children match the cows, which we say, yes, they are also wrong. And we take measures to make sure that the payment is made, but it cannot be the same. You know, so in that direction, you now see a situation where the farmers also go after the cows. I mean, you were in that theater and operated for a number of years. So what are the main sides to this dispute? We know that there are farmers on the one hand who are uh, assumed to be the, uh, quote unquote, the indigenes. And then we have the, uh, the, the elders, the elders, you know. Now, is this the only nature of the crisis or are there other uh, religious or other dimensions to it? Is it just a, you know, I, I know that there's a bit of uh, farmer elders clashes in this, in this conflict, but is that everything that is happening in the theater of the conflict? Or are there other things going on? To the very best of my understanding, there is a kind of historical background to this situation. So people need to read up. I see a lot of people making comments on TV and so on. Some of them are not actually informed about what is going on in, in most of these conflict zones. They need to visit the locations, talk to the people, find out what the situation is before you go on air and start talking. What am I saying? There are some, is there are some background to some of this uh, situation which we all know in this country. So that is a part. The second, the second aspect of it is that as time goes on, there is some level of injustice that are not being carried out. You will find out that you, you, you mean, you the mean injustice attackers that will are exploit not, more. Yeah, general, general, just to put it clear, you mean injustice that have not been redressed? Yes. So the attackers will feel free to explore more. And that's what is happening. There is, gov there, there is, there is usually a government in the state, and they, 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 each of them come and do their own thing and still pretend as if. This situation is beyond me. Like a lot of people are recommending, if there is a, a team, because I'm aware that a lot of things have been done in terms of report and other things, nothing's been done. In 2018, when I was there, when the, we had the incident, they said they should go and establish a MOPOL. The MOPOL, uh, I don't know, maybe it's a regiment or whatever, to, in that place. Mm -hmm. If it's there now, I don't know. There should be some elements of the police also spread across the area so that this free movement of, of people holding weapons will stop. I don't know the extent. I've not been to, to the location. I to think the there area was also a recommendation movement. to have a military base in the area. Yes. Yes. So, and then it was there. It was in the meeting when the VP uh, Osibajo came uh, and told the, 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 the state that I feel I've said the six billion era that uh, is provided for con uh, peace building and uh, peace consolidation. Ah, it was like no, they've never heard about it. Okay, we are going to apply. Okay, if they had applied before now, what has been done? Or was the money released or was it not released? So some of these things mm -hmm. were, I mean, are things that are supposed to have been done. So I will just say here that, look, it's good 
if you want to provide a solution to a problem, set up an implementation strategy and follow it step by step. Where is it? We need to develop what we call national will. People are talking about political will. Is there only politicians that are operating in this country? I wanted to have your take on uh, the allegations, you know, uh, which is basically everywhere. It's gone viral. It's been ar uh, around for a while. Uh, General T.Y. Danjuman actually said on national TV, and it went viral on social media, everybody has heard this, that in many of these instances, some of this violence, this conflict, that you have people colluding within the military, sorry, within the security agencies, including the military, it was even very specific. What's your opinion about that? Well, I read in the, I read in the papers that uh, one of the STF commanders also said a similar thing. I, I, I think maybe they have their facts. And that's the reason why there's need to bring people on board to do certain jobs in this direction. You, uh, uh, General T.Y. Danjuma is not somebody that talks out of the So, and uh, General Yola also, I am sure, is not just fabricating story. So I, I think uh, in all of this, if there is an evidence that uh, uh, such things exist, uh, the military has a way of uh, handling it. Uh, you have been in the, in the theater. You commanded the military... Uh, action. What do you think has to be done, you know, from your own experience, if you were to have uh, the opportunity to speak to the, the commander in chief or the president, that this is what you need to do to stop this situation? What will you say, uh, General? The, the state has what they call peace building architecture. It's a, it's, it's a book, it's a booklet. And uh, to the best of my understanding, I, I did a study on that. And I found out that it contains quite a lot of things that could remedy some of these things. What I know is that the state might not have enough money to implement most of their uh, the, the, the strategies they had laid out. So maybe in that direction, if the gov federal government provides such avenues for them to access funds, then or maybe they call set up a committee to look at it, then they'll be able to see what level of assistance they can give to the state to go to assist. Then the other part, the other thing is, look, government should not be lukewarm. If you find an, an insecurity situation within your state over the years, and the government come and they go, and they, don't, they, they, are, they are not doing anything about it, then they are not doing enough. So I know a lot of them are, they are scared. Maybe if you, if you go and set, start doing something, or let me not use the word that they are scared. They are just being like, okay, I don't want to create any problem. Mm. You know, you are, you are because if of you go and some now. people, yes, um, those in power also, you go there, maybe if you go after some people, maybe they will come and uh, go to your village and raise the place down. Some of those things are there. But if, if we have, General, okay, just so as, as we wrap up, if, as, if we have a situation where uh, the people that are supposed to be in charge of the security themselves are afraid. What kind of future do, do you think that pertains to our security as a people? Last question, General. So it is the reason why the federal government has to take this thing on by itself. I think it's either it's, the situation is underreported or the doubt national will I'm talking about is not there. There is, there is a, there's a, a youth organization you know, that have, you know, they, 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 they have the, the, the goal of, you know, seeing how peace can be achieved. Mm. But who is listening to them? Anyway, General, 2018. You know, yeah, because of our time, you know, we will have to continue this conversation uh, some other time. And thank you so much for providing the insights uh, that you have given. We hope and believe uh, that, the, that the government, especially like you said, uh, the federal government led by the president, will uh, uh, take uh, the effective uh, actions to stop uh, this uh, recurrent crisis you know, in, in, in Plato and in other parts of the country. 
Uh, we have to be hopeful. And uh, the, the president has spoken, you know, to say that uh, this will be dealt with. So, so let's be hopeful and we, we keep the discussion going on. Thank you so much uh, for your time. And thank you so much for uh, uh, watching our viewers. Uh, it's a happy new year to you and Inside Sources will be back next week. Thank you. My name is Laulu Akonyo.